This is the Wise Guy Radio Show, a podcast dedicated to educating and inspiring through conversations with today's top talents in the world of glass. We will be dissecting their journeys in hopes to deliver actionable content that you, the artist, can start implementing now, helping you grow not only as a creative spirit, but also a successful artistic entrepreneur. With a little organization, relationship building, and your artistic ability, you can obtain greatness. Climb aboard, whether an artist, retail owner, or enthusiast. We have a ton of fun in store for you. Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by American Helix. The American Helix is a revolutionary new concept in smoking technology. Designed and manufactured by American glassblowers, this pipe is light years ahead of its time. Based on Brunoli's principle, the shape of the pipe along with an innovative intake system creates a venturi effect through precision micro holes in the chamber, which results in a slower burn that conserves tobacco and gives a smooth, refreshing smoking experience, making the American Helix the smoothest hitting pipe on the market. For further info or to locate their products, you can find them online at AmericanHelix.com. That's AmericanHelix.com. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Zen Glass Studios. Located in the heart of St. Petersburg, Florida, Zen Glass has a wide range of offerings to choose from. Their menu includes one-on-one or group classes in their hot shop or flame working studio, create your own wine glass, and so much more. If you're a traveling artist, they even have a space to rent that you can temporarily call home. With over 50 years of combined experience, Zen Glass can help you fine-tune your techniques, whether you're a novice or advanced glass artist. For their calendar of events, including info about their third Thursday studio jams, you can contact Zen at zenglass.com. That's zenglass.com. Hey, what's happening? Welcome to Wise Guy Radio Show, episode number 159. This is your host, Jason Michael, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today's episode is the beginning of a series for the month of May, where we are talking about lifestyle development and reasons why being a glass artist gives you the capability to do whatever the hell you want to do, whether it's work out of your house, work on the road, work in another country, uh, all that good stuff. And today's first episode is featuring Luke the Drifter, uh, or Luke Bayless, and uh, Luke has been living the RV life, as his name goes. And uh, we get into his name and how he kind of came about doing that. And uh, he's actually, we, we did this interview uh, via Skype, but he was in his little mini short bus that he recently purchased uh, that he uses to travel the country. And uh, he's got all of his stuff that he can just throw in the back of the bus and haul ass and hit the road and travel from studio to studio. And all the interviews we will be having this month, including wrapping up the month of May with J.D. Mabelson again coming back on to talk about his uh, new Borrowed Time production, Vagabong. That uh, documentary he just came out with, which is all about his covering his experience. But for today, we got Luke the Drifter. And Luke has been at this game for a long, long, long time, as long as myself, uh, going on 17, 18 years. And uh, oh, I just turned my freaking uh, thing off here. Um, but uh, yeah, so it was a definitely a lot of fun, good conversation. Uh, we get into a lot of talk about uh, how things were. Uh, kind of the old men on the front porch kind of conversation. A couple grumpy old men bitching and complaining about how things used to be and walking uphill backwards and through the snow barefoot, you know, kind of stuff. And then just where the industry is now and kind of the the still surreal landscape that we're all in. It's pretty, pretty awesome to see. So I definitely hope you enjoy that. Uh, I wanted to announce that our beta test group that I put together is officially filled up. Uh, there's three artists that are on board now to come on board. Who I cannot thank enough for being a part of this to help me get this uh, these online courses all fine tuned and geared up. Uh, we've got some filming done, but my daughter, who is going to be my main person to help me do all my film and editing, she's my project manager basically, uh, is graduating high school tonight, which I cannot believe. And uh, so once she's done with, done with school and gets her stuff settled in for the summertime, she's going to be on board helping me get all the filming and editing done for everything. So we're going to have a high class fine tune. Institute for learning how to be the best glass artist you can be. Uh, we'll be covering everything from basic introduction into flame working to business to lifestyle development, everything you can think of. Uh, but the first course we're going to be offering is a Critters and Creatures course, which officially starts in July, but the beta testers are starting here next month. And again, they're going to be helping me get all the bugs worked out. And I'll have many, many more details to come, uh, including a couple webinars and uh, starting Facebook Live here really soon. 
Um, the laptop, I've had, and also just, <clears throat> excuse me, good Lord have mercy. I'm sure you enjoyed that in your ear. Uh, I got to thank too everybody who reached out to me to ask about my laptop issue that I'm having. I uh, just love how the community reaches out. Uh, I've been re receiving a shit ton of emails and messages and Facebook messages and Instagram chats. And uh, I can't thank everybody enough for reaching out and, and just sharing your love for the show and how you came across it and sharing your stories and, uh, you know, your personal stories and journeys and including the help with the laptop. Uh, it's still at a point where it's still down. I'm actually probably just going to end up purchasing something new here pretty soon, especially now that we have the beta test group filled up. And uh, with the, the fees that they're paying me to be in the course, I'm going to be using all those monies to make sure I have the best equipment possible, including video work, even though we've got GoPros and what have you already done, but uh, including my laptop and some, some hardware and stuff. So I'm definitely excited about that. And, and again, I can't thank you all enough for... Uh, supporting myself and the show and the community and all we're doing and the reason I do this is for you so I just got to say I love you and thank you big hugs to everybody listening to this right now thank you thank you thank you I'm trying to think what else has been going on uh, we all know Mountain Glass has their awesome sales going on definitely go to mountainglass.com check out all their sales color clear glass kilns torches going on and uh, big thanks to all of our supporters and uh, the sponsors for this podcast definitely would not be here without you all. So thank you. Thank you again. Uh, looking forward to getting myself to shit together here. Uh, going to be purchasing tickets here pretty soon to get the glass roots. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to have a booth or not. I have a couple guys who have offered for me to carry some of my work with them, but mostly going to be going up there just to shoot the shit and uh, do interviews. So I will be announcing here pretty soon for those that are interested that are going to be going to glass roots uh, that would like to be a guest on the show to come on board to uh, meet with me there. We're going to be doing some one-on-one -on -one in in-person interviews, which is going to be awesome for the first time. I've only done one interview so far with in someone in person, and it was a lot of fun, but I'm looking forward to uh, bringing the art, you know, artists on to do that. So uh, other than that, I'm not going to ramble anymore. I'm going to let you get to the show because this is, again, a great conversation with Luke Bayless. Uh, again, it goes by Luke the Drifter. Uh, he's a manufacturer of color, of millies, of amazing glass, and, uh, again, he shares his story and his journey, and it's a lot of fun. So definitely hope you enjoy. So, again, thanks for tuning in to episode 159 featuring Luke the Drifter. And we will talk to you next time. Don't forget to go to iTunes. Leave us a, a five-star review if you think the show deserves it. A comment as well or any kind of review is always helpful. So please do that for us. Uh, I'm going to be going on there here this week and writing down names of all those who have left me comments and starting to do some shout-outs and stuff. I just to thank all those who have definitely done that. And I'm going to be holding a contest here pretty soon as we get close to reaching 1,000 followers on our Instagram page. You can follow us on Instagram at wise guy underscore radio on instagram or you can follow my personal instagram page which is j michael glass all one word and uh yeah we got like 900 and something followers right now on our instagram page for this podcast and i'm almost at a thousand and it's pretty neat to see it just organically as this grows and we're almost at ninety-five thousand downloads for this podcast right now which is fucking crazy <laughs> which means we probably had about 200,000 listens and we're spreading out throughout the world, uh, 65 countries about right now, I think is what the last number we counted. Just amazing. So like, I'm rambling, I know, but I just can't help but share with you guys what's going on. So share with your friends and family, post them on social media, and part of our contest coming up is going to be all about that. I've got some uh, big box full of fun, free stuff for you all as thank yous for that. And uh, until next time, enjoy this episode with Luke, and we'll talk to you soon. Love you. Be good. And stay hydrated. Peace. Man's inhumanity to man, all those things cause complication and creation. See, the domination of one nation to another nation, all those things cause complication. See? What's up, Luke? Welcome to the show. Hey, how you doing? Pretty good, brother. Glad to be here. Yeah, man. Glad to have you on. We've been uh, playing phone tag and what have you for a couple months now, and it's good to get you on the road here. And since you are always on the road, in a sense, <laughs> 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 it's 
So it's been timing wise, it's been killer to, to uh, get you on here. And uh, part of your journey and your fun, your story, you know, your your alias out there is Luke the Drifter, and some might take that as a bad thing, but I think it's pretty badass. And then kind of seeing this newer, you know, trend and concept of artists who I've been meeting personally who have this RV lifestyle and traveling nomads per se and artists. And I think it's one of the blessings and beauty of what we do as glass artists. Like my buddy Frank Strunk's always said that we're like strippers. We can take our talents and go anywhere and make money. And more yeah, or less, you know, yeah. it's a fact. So, <laughs> you know, with some limited supplies and some gumption, you know, you can do whatever the hell you got to do to survive. But, you know, our goals are is to do more than survive. And I think that yourself and a lot of the other artists out there on the road have found this lifestyle that just can't be beat, you know. And it's kind of fun when you see the journey of the functional industry stemming from the dead tours and how the dead tour was just that. It was this nomadic community of the lifestyle. And, you know, it's now we're now we're doing it individually and also as a group and a community too. So it's, uh, I guess hats off to you brother to continuation in this, uh, tradition in a sense. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a good time to be a glass blower. Uh, talking about the whole drifter thing, the name, uh, is a reference to Hank Williams senior and, uh, some arguments he got in with his record label. They didn't want him doing a, spoken word album so he changed his name and went and signed with somebody else for a minute and it was a nickname my uh, my ex gave me when i was uh when i still had a tattoo shop and it kind of stuck and it fits with the traveling lifestyle for sure for yeah. sure yeah absolutely it sure does man well before we get too off sidetrack here i always like to start off by asking uh, your superhero origin story in a sense and where you got yourself started with the torch okay so um I was, uh, as I am right now, I was uh, in Eugene, Oregon. I was uh, working a couple of jobs that, you know, weren't all that good. <laughs> you know, I was making money and surviving, and a couple of my friends were blowing glass. And uh, I'd see, uh, I was working at uh, the Circle K up on up on campus there, you know, Eugene at all, 13th and High Circle K like right there on campus and uh freeman corbin had his shop about two blocks up the street and his crew would come in two three in the morning all red-faced and glassy-eyed and we, we got the bullshitting and uh, i started watching those guys blow glass a little bit and then uh my buddy kyle uh he goes by kaja glass these days uh he started blowing glass on the other side of town and i just started hanging out and watching them getting into any shop i could every chance i could and watching and trying to just soak everything up because i've been obsessed with glass since i was a little kid and first saw it at mouth berry farm oh nice and uh yeah seeing uh seeing people do it for real right there in front of me i was just like oh man finally finally and uh i uh i was watching kyle and his buddies uh Dylan and Loudon, uh, out at their place here in town, they had a little shop and I helped, uh, help around, you know, I'd come and sweep it up or bring coffee, top off the knockoff jars or whatever, just come and be us and always try to buy their pieces as cheap as I could. And then, you know, go hustle them to my friends and do all the other uh, associated activities that kind of hang around on the edge of our industry. And, uh, one day we went out and ran a bunch of errands and I ended up with a torch and goggles and set up that night and started blowing glass. Nice. Uh, I was after like six months of like standing at the end of the bench, just watching and watching and watching and borrowing goggles and trying to like, Hey, can I get on there and try to make a mushroom? You know, Hey, like you're, you're going for a, you go for a walk, taking, you know, getting a cup of coffee. You mind if I like try to pull some stringers and, Anytime I'd sweep the floor, I'd keep any scraps of color I could find. And, you know, I just uh, built up a little horde of little bits and pieces and ends. And then uh, one day I ended up with a National Hand Torch with a crappy half burnout tip and some used used rose ditties and uh, a couple of sticks of color, a little nib of silver and a case of, uh, what, 12 mil tube. And... I busted out a shitload of spin trail and wrap and rake slides. Nice. And the next day I took those to 
local head shop and sold all but two or three of them for about three dollars and seventy five cents a piece. And I've been blowing glass since. Uh, wait amazing. a minute, <laughs> I, <laughs> I I can make a, a a week's pay in a night just by having fun. I'm in. Yeah, exactly. What a concept, right? <laughs> yeah. That's there's too a, funny. those super easy days where everything you make fucking sells instantly. Yeah. They're not as few and far between as they uh have been, but uh some sometimes they're a lot closer together and sometimes they're a lot farther apart. Uh following the the trends on what sells like I mean, if I was making shit that I was making in ninety seven, ninety eight and expecting it to sell, I mean, I could probably sell the stuff. It wouldn't sell easy, and it wouldn't sell quick, but somewhere out there, somebody still needs a, a slide bowl for their old fucking JBD bong. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, it's funny, bro. I was actually talking to a buddy of mine the other day about the old JBDs, and the, you know they kind of had their little niche in the market with their slide size, because everything back then was like 9.5, 9.5, you know, with the grommets and blah, 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 and... All of a sudden, Jerome Baker comes out with their their own size, and I'm like, "Damn, the fuck!" But then it gave us all a chance to make slides for that market, just for the J- Jerome Baker market. You know what I mean? It's so yeah, funny how yeah. things have evolved since then. I mean, God, that was you know almost 20 years ago. Now it seems like so. Yeah, well, it's, and it's interesting. Being here in Eugene, I got to see a lot of the markets that people outside of town didn't. Right. While JBD and Jaw and a couple of those other big tube companies. We're smashing shit out that everybody saw everywhere. There were all sorts of literal, like mom and pop married couple shops where there'd be a dude hand spinning tubes on rollers and his old lady making slides and down stems, and they'd only sell them to six or seven shops, and that covered their output, you know? Yep. And some of that stuff was so amazing and nice, and you know, no name people that they're gone. They're out of the scene and you'll never hear from them again. They were making stuff that, uh, you know, was just as nice as anything that's on the market today. But it's, it's, uh, it's crazy how many people just stepped out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of wonder too, with the new trends of, you know, the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of new artists that we have now, how many in 10 years from now are going to still be around, you know, cause those of us that have been doing this since more or less the birth of the, of the industry, you know, we've had our ebbs and flows and we've, we have the passion and the bug to get through it all. I mean, don't get me wrong, bro. I've had a side job here and there and you know, whatever, but like the glass lifestyle is what it really comes down to. Whatever the hell, whatever, you know, just melting glass. I could make a blob of glass oh, every day and I'd be happy. Shit. When I started having kids, I, uh, I bought a tattoo shop just cause I needed to have guaranteed income. Yeah. You know, there was a uh, glass was uh, doing all right, but, there's a kid now, mm-hmm. and I can't, uh, excuse me, can't have a slow month when there's three mouths to feed. Mm-hmm. So we bought a tattoo shop and put the put the glass blowing in one area and then had tattooing and piercing in a head shop up front. So all the glass I was making that I wasn't selling in other shops, I was getting straight up retail for in my own shop. And, you know, and the income from the piercers and tattoo artists that were paying me chair fees. So that was a uh, that was a nice little uh, nice little era. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't think I I don't think I could ever do that again. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's a lot of work because I know myself. I've thought about that too. Like you know, instead of going to rent and sweat and you know, just paying five hundred bucks a month for a rent at a space to go like spend five to six hundred bucks on rent at a retail location that I can make all my production for like a catalog in there to help offset the cost for the rent and then have a little bit extra I can put in cases and then bring other artists in and you know have that dream of running a retail store but once that dream comes to reality dude it's a lot of fucking work <laughs> you know? oh, it really is and that old uh, that old saying uh, good help is hard to find yeah, dude there is nothing truer yep and in the tattoo industry, holy shit! Yeah, I I, I could not, I couldn't keep employees in there. There's one guy that was a wonderful employee. I fucking loved him. He just worked his ass off, but he was as well nomadic. There were specific shops in specific states at, you know, like this time of year. There's, you know, there's spring break, so I got to be in Fort Myer for these three weeks. And then I got to be in Atlantic City for two weeks during this 
Biker Fest, and I got he he uh, had he had a um, standing uh, engagement at one of the tattoo shops in Sturgis. He tattooed there every year, so whenever he wasn't on the road, I'd get him for two or three weeks in my shop. Hmm. But you know, that was that was my most dependable employee, and he was the one that was a guest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, and and that's the you know it's it's like with the drive right now and the and the hunger for you know, the love of what we do from other people outside of the industry that want to get into it. It's, you know, it's so easy to go into it. And like two weeks later, you're the best glass blower on earth. And the next thing you know, you're like, okay, I'm fuck this guy. I'm who I'm learning from. I'm going to do my own thing. And now, and then you realize how difficult it really is. And then you end up selling all your shit on eBay for half the price, you know, or whatever, you know, and it's, it sucks, you know, definitely, um, a phenomenon I've noticed in uh, new glass blowers and not like new as in recent, but new as in new to the game, mm-hmm. it, we, we called it sophomoreitis. Like, uh, I, I worked in production shops on and off, ran some production shops, and it's something that is not only, not only my observation, a lot of people have pointed this out. Kid will come in with absolutely no skills under his belt. You train him on two or three pieces. He'll have a couple ideas of his own, which is, fucking awesome if you don't there's something wrong right but then next thing they know nothing you say matters anymore they've got it oh oh, i got it i got it oh no 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 i got it i got this i got this under control oh no i figured it out already and from that point on they don't want to hear a fucking thing you have to say and they're either gonna go burn a couple bridges and get big or realize that they're being assholes and stomp that shit right the fuck out right there and become a, a good artist with good relationships or they'll sell their shit real soon when they burn a couple of bridges and realize it ain't fucking easy yeah. and you don't know it all. Yep. Like it's a, uh, it's a long learning curve. Sure. Yeah, dude, I keep saying like we're all 20 year overnight successes. You know, it's, you know, this, you know, like if you're if you're lucky enough and fortunate enough, like say like Lion Glass, who gets an apprentice under Joe Peters and then has this amazing line of work because of the skill set he learned working under a guy like Joe Peters, it cuts out so much of the bullshit. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like it's like why I preach about mastermind groups and having a mentor because it really does save you so much time and energy to get you to focus on specifically what you need to learn from foundational to all the way to growth to medium sized work. And then, you're, you know, your next thing you know, you're a semi expert, even if you're only three years into it. And it's, it's huge. And I think oh, you know, it's beneficial for the industry right now that those that, that have the opportunity to get that under their belt, but there's, there's, that's only like maybe 5% of those out there right now. I'm honest to God, jealous of the kids that are coming up right now. Yeah. Right. When when I first started, there was a curtain up, like physically, mm-hmm. curtains up in shops in between stations. So your shop mate couldn't figure out how to do what you were doing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so true. Pe- people hid techniques. Like, there was no sharing. Yep. And, I, you know, I... I that never made any sense to me because all of the really fast, rapid growth I saw were in the shops that the guys wanted to share and wanted to work together and collaborate and grow. There was a, a couple of guys I was working with. One of them, uh, they, I don't remember what the hell, it might, might have been uh, one of the Fowler Vessel VHS tapes. And the term decorative lip wrap came up hmm. and one of the guys said, Oh my God, the next tube I make, make I'm going to write decorative lip wrap in stringers around the mouthpiece. And everybody laughed Had a good time. The next morning when the kilns got open, one of the guys in the room had gone back out into the shop and made a piece <laughs> and wrote the shit down, but not the guy that said he was going to do it. Somebody else did it like, ha ha, fuck you did it. And that type of uh, pushing each other can can be beneficial. Yeah. You know, one day one day one guy figures out a donut, the next day guy figures out how to put donuts on the arms of those donuts, and then we got a quad donut. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It just trying to one up your shopmates. You can't do that with curtains up. No, not at all. And yeah, and then uh, then torch talk came around. 
or I read, sorry, <laughs> a little slip there, sorry, uh, melting pot. Yep. The uh, came around, and even before they had pictures there, just people in a forum that the only topic of discussion was glass. I think that website helped the the older guys really blow up. That and uh, glasspipes.org and glassartists.org mm-hmm. starting to show each other pictures. Holy crap, man. Yeah. Like, And kids starting today, oh, that's already there. Yeah. Like, It's not in their future. It, it exists. They, you can... You can know nothing about glass other than you went to a party and somebody gave you a dab and said, yeah, this rig's worth 3000 bucks," And you go, wait a minute, what? I've never heard of such a thing. That's crazy. And then you Google $3,000 bomb. And the whole industry that we've been building for the last however long is just boom, right there on the Internet at your fingertips. I mean, you can watch the guy that made that to make it, yeah. if, you know, he probably has a live feed of some stuff of that construction on his, on his page somewhere, you know, it's, yeah. uh, and when, when I was starting up, you'd go into a shop and see a piece with a technique you didn't understand. And you'd buy that piece and sit it on your bench and just, keep staring at it until you can figure yeah. out how to make it. Oh, yeah, dude, totally. <laughs> yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I would go around to the local smoke shops and like a couple, you know, like Chameleon Glass would roll through town. And I had some friends that ran a shop here locally and they were like, hey, Chameleon just came through. Come check out what we got. And I would go to their shop and I'd go hit like 10 other sh- shops in the area that I knew they would go to and just study the glass. And they're like, I wouldn't buy anything, but I would, you know, I remember seeing, I don't know who it was that was making them, but there was a series of hand pipes that were going around and it was like checkerboard patterns, like kind of like a mosaic tile kind of look to it and something else. Oh, it was like a dot box kind of, kind of, you know, thing going down. And, mm-hmm. and, and they were all clean as shit, like high quality, you know, production stuff. And this is, 18, 17, 16 years ago, whatever it was, maybe now, 15 years ago. But still, it was like for back then, the quality, I, I haven't seen anybody doing it like anything like that recently at all. And I had to go there and like, man, how the fuck do they do this thing? And then go home and try and figure it out. And I'd figure it out. But I was only able to figure it out because I had a foundation that I got from somebody who I learned from in person who'd been doing it for 35 years. And I, mm-hmm. you know, even though I got a really basic, I mean, I learned beads and pendants and shit. It wasn't like anything special, but it gave me the knowledge I needed. But just like you, bro, I sat and watched about the guy, my, my master who taught me for six months before I was even allowed to touch a torch. I would sit there and fill little bottles of glitter <laughs> and watch him bang out these dragons all fucking day long or fairies. And I would watch the production side of it. You know, like one day he would do all the bodies and add all the textures and stuff. And then the yep. next day he'd heat them up and add all the wings and the claws and the details. And, you know, and just seeing this, this master sculptor I mean, at the, and at the time he'd been doing it for 35 years. Now he's, you know, this is 18 years later. So now he's almost got 50 years under his belt. I would love to see what he's doing nowadays, but you he have broke that artistic ability down into production steps. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Proven, proven what I've been saying for years, that doing production will never hurt your art. And no, it'll never hurt your art. It's the bread and butter that helps you to survive to be able to create the artwork too. You know, and a lot of folks want to just jump into the artwork and then try and make a living, and then they get frustrated because they're not. And it's like, dude, because you're trying to make art. I appreciate your, you know, your mindset, and I respect it. However, you got to step it back a little bit. You know, a couple guys I've interviewed on the show here that were they they're not artists. They're more in the production mind, and they're trying to find mm-hmm. that, that art in them. You know, and they want to find the outlet, but it's hard for them because their brain is wrapped around business and production. You know, and like I, I did. Some, you know, go on. I'm sorry. I'm I'm an artist in the in the fact that I've always drawn and painted and sculpted. Like I've always tried to create stuff, but in my in my glass art, I don't know that I consider myself a glass artist. I would. I, I'm a craftsman. Mm-hmm. And like every piece I make that's a pipe, the function comes first. And then the decoration and adornment comes second. Right, me too. Like, I'm 100% function over form. It's it's got to work right. It doesn't matter how if, if your pipe's gorgeous and it looks amazing from every angle, but if if you suck water every time you hit it, it's a piece of shit. Yeah, it's called a straw. <laughs> <laughs> and I've made yeah, several of those I, before. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, you know, that's the stuff you don't want out of the shop. Yeah. So uh, that's what research and development's about. You can't, uh, you can't win them all. I mean, there's a, 
I made a fuckload of recyclers trying to refine this one design. And no matter how I did it, it just didn't work the way I wanted it to. And then once I finally got all the plumbing functional, it was so far away from the look that I wanted that like, you don't see me making them because it just, it, they worked great, but the, they weren't aesthetically pleasing. So I got the, I got the function down and then, uh, the form was lost in, in nailing down the function. So I just, I, I benched that plan mm-hmm. and, uh, I'll, I'll probably come back. To, it's a very specific type of plumbing that looks really cool. And, uh, I've put it in a couple things here and there, but uh, when I finally get it right in the right recycler, it, it's going to look fucking nice. Yeah, man. <laughs> but it's but it's important too that yeah. as, even though you've been doing this for a long time, that you're still trying to do the newer stuff. Because like myself too, like I had to sit down and see if I can make a client just because I've I love the concept. I've always enjoyed that the the, the the concept of the client from like you know fifty, sixty, seventy, whatever long ago it was initially made, but. I've had that respect for it, and I wanted to try it. Same with the same with the recycler, bro. I've probably made ten recyclers over the last six months, just trying to find that proper function. And it's like it's almost there. It function. I mean, it still functions. Don't get me wrong. It still works like a recycler, but it wasn't what I was going for, and what I you know what I had hoped to see the end result with. So it's the same thing. I've benched yeah, it for now. I can bang out a, a really nice functioning recycler that looks like a, looks like it's. You know, a direct knockoff of Eric Anders all day long. Exactly. Yep. But I don't want to do that. Yep. <laughs> I, it's that's not a. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't want to reproduce other people's work. Yeah. Exactly. So, hey, hey, Luke, can you give me one second, brother? I got a. My uh, I'm just realizing my batteries on my recorder are just about low. I want to plug this thing in before it, it dies on us. Yeah, man. Give me like two minutes. Or not even that, but I'll be right. I'll be right back. So a fresh cup of coffee. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, you're good. Yeah, and traffic background noise, it's all good. I like the the transparency of the show and keeping it raw because, like, I get like the birds in the background and shit. And I've got friends calling me like, "Dude, I was listening, yeah. listening to the show and I was I was hearing birds and I'm like looking around like, what the fuck am I, you know, <laughs> thinking they've got birds <laughs> in the car or something?" <laughs> yeah, 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 it's funny. I'm parked over by my uh, my favorite coffee shop. So it's great. Even uh, whenever they get new trainees, like. I'll come through and see somebody I've never even seen before. And they'll be like, all right, they told me your look. They told me what your drink is. Here you go. <laughs> and like, uh, that's, uh, they're, they're well trained. You tip, tip them right and they get your coffee right. Hell yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a good thing to have. That's for damn sure. Yep, yep. Cool, man. So, uh, now if they had Dutch feathers everywhere like, uh, like they got fucking Starbucks, I'd be happy. <laughs> yeah i know what you mean we've got a kawa coffee here and i think that i don't know if they started here in the area or what but they're slowly expanding around our county and into different areas and uh they're the same way dude. they got they get great service super you know it's not that it's 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 a little bit cheaper than starbucks's kind of deal but uh heck yeah way better coffee too like just the quality of their stuff is killer Yeah, dude. So uh, to pick up back where you were, you know, it's kind of going through the that this generation has it easier than our generation did kind of thing. You know, like I, Rashawn Jones and I always laugh. We sit on like we're like the old men on the front porch telling the kids to get off our grass kind of shit. You know, like you don't know how it was back mm-hmm. in the day, you know. But, uh, you know, real. you know, but it's true. You know, it's like I, I and that's part of why I like doing the show, because it really gets to bring on the OGs like yourself on here to really talk about the, the days, you know, like I remember being offered to go out to Cali to go check out this guy's studio. But he wanted like two thousand dollars for me just to go in his fucking door, you know, just to, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I can't do that shit, bro. But then, like, yeah. when I was learning how to do inside out back in the day, I, you know, I, I'm really good with science. I understand it. I understand how things work. But I also like tend to overthink things because of it. So, like, you know, I'm yeah. burning, I'm burning my hand. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing wrong? I understand the concept. Like, I was doing like cut and flips and things because I didn't understand that you had to plug up your mouthpiece or just have it sealed off. You know, yeah. you know. And a buddy of mine comes yeah. over. He's like, yeah, dude, check this out. And just, you know, he's got like, you know, the long, dirty hair, drippy, you know, dready kid from fucking fish, right off fish tour, you know kind of thing and he's like check this out dude and he's like wads up the paper sticks it in his mouth gets it all wet and throws it in the blowpipe and he's like now stick this in the flame and it was like oh my god bro <laughs> thank you thank you oh, thank you yeah. 
And that and that one little thing, dude, it honestly changed my entire perspective of how glass worked, but also why it's so important to, to share this knowledge. Because it was like that around here, mm-hmm. even, even locally, there was only like five of us that were doing this, and it was dog eat dog. I had we have a local guy, uh, Colby. He's he has a shop called It's All Good, and he was like he's even to this day his shop still like. It's super small, but he's had like the stuff in from the Jason Lees and the Scott Deppies and stuff from back in the day, you know, it was like what we would get around mm-hmm. here. And, uh, he was doing glass at the time and he was showing me some stuff that he was getting tired of making and being young and naive. I didn't understand the concept of, I shouldn't be making this for myself too. And trying to sell it, you know, like I was making his batches and then I was making my batches and I was selling them for the same price he was selling them for. But it was the fact that I was making his shit for myself and for him. It was, you know, it wasn't good business and I've learned that since, no. but you know, but I, I still made me realize like how, even though this community's tight at the time, it was all about like, I know what I know and I can't tell you because you'll become my competition. And you know, when you yeah. have that, that kind of attitude, it's like, if you're worried that someone's going to steal your idea, then either you're not passionate enough about it or you just shouldn't fucking worry about doing it. If you're scared about it, you know? Yep. So. I get excited when I see somebody take knowledge I've given them and, blow it up yeah i completely agree like, absolutely it, not, nothing nothing happier or no happier times than when somebody actually picks up on what i'm putting down yeah and they take it and they do it better than you do it <laughs> it's even better <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then, oh man yeah you know and then you have them show you like okay now you show me what you did to make this better and then they show you and then you can do it yourself it's like this little circle of life you know sharing knowledge man uh not to drop names or anything, but uh, when I was out in Kansas, I shared a shared a shop with a bunch of guys out there, and one of them was Adam Reese. Okay, yeah. He was already doing doing uh, shadows that blow blow my mind. Like his his work was already super clean, and he saw some of my fumicellos, and he asked me how I was doing them, and I explained, you know, just verbally how I did them. And a couple of days later, a case of scallop tubing showed up, and he said, "Anyway, could you show me? You know, give you give you some of this scallop tubing. You just show me what you're talking about, because you know you you told me, but could you show me?" And I did a demo of one with air traps, and I did a demo of one uh, with the ridges smoothed out and no air traps. So you, uh, you know, mm-hmm. the two different styles that are really easy to do. And a couple of days later. He was doing them nicer than I've ever been able to do them, <laughs> and just, just gorgeous. And I, it, it, it makes my chest swell thinking about it. Like, I, he took something that I could do all right and just took it one step further instantly. Yeah. And like, it, I'm not mad. I'm stoked. That's 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 fucking awesome. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, his work's always blown my mind, dude. I remember a buddy of mine had a pendant of his. It was a it was a Reitz pendant with a Jason Burris wrap around it, so it was like super fucking heady, you know. But it was like all oh, these yeah. all these sunken opals that were in there too, and it was it was right when the opals were really getting to be hot in the industry, you know, about five years ago, six years ago now. Mm-hmm. And uh, but they were like completely recessed in the piece, and I'm like, how the fuck is he doing this? There's like ten of them, you know, like, and they're all perfectly s- symmetrically apart. You know, the spacing, his line work was all clean. There was no yeah. deviations. Nothing that the lines were getting pushed apart because he was adding glass to it. You know, it was like, it was so classy. And still to this day, like, I still ponder on these kind of things. Like, how are these guys doing this shit? It's like they're aliens. Like I, yeah. I would say that about Scott Deppy. Like Scott Deppy came down here from some kind of UFO of some sort and blew our fucking minds and, yeah. and still is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah, I've got no, uh, no, uh, what do you call it, uh, misconceptions that I'm ever going to be on that level of technically fucking awesome and whatnot, but if I can just keep putting out solid work that makes me happy and looks clean and is made with techniques that keep me entertained making them, I'll be a happy guy. Yeah. Like, right now I've been doing a whole lot of uh, um, Zampirico tubing. I don't even know if that's the right term because, I, I don't know, I don't speak Italian. I've never uh, never taken any soft glass courses, but uh, that's, that's what I was told it was called. Yeah, so, yeah, like the twisty uh, cane pattern that goes down, goes down? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I make a bunch of uh, bunch of cane work, a lot of chinos, twist the chinos, whatever you want to call them, swizzle sticks. Mm-hmm. And then I sort all those out into like length and size and try to keep them as, as clean as I can. And then uh, do a stick stack, like the same way we used to do uh, line tubing before people used to do or before people started doing back stacks. Yeah, just take all the color rod and rubber band them or wire them around a whatever graphite rod or glass tube or whatever i use glass <laughs> but you know do that and uh bing bang boom make that into tubing actually uh i don't even want to get into the details of that but you can look at uh my glass line article it's got 100 fucking pictures and a handful of pages describing exactly how to do it nice but it's uh it keeps me entertained and uh I know there's a couple guys that are pissed off that I share how to do it, but, I mean, it's not like it's uh, too hard to figure out once you realize what's going on. Well, it's like the stringer stack millies nowadays, you know? Like, I remember Jason Lee was posting up some stuff, him and Tara, when they were working together doing the stuff, and she was doing his prep, and he was all about sharing how to do it, and... You know, it made so much sense, but then the reality is, is actually doing it. There's so much fucking prep work and timing that takes to do those things. Even like what you're doing, bro. It's like, oh, man. you know, you got you got to pull hundreds of feet of cane down to get just enough of the right size to make what you got to make to make your, you know, it all symmetrical. Oh yeah. You know, like taking this this uh, class with Joe Peters a couple of years ago. You know, he was telling us about his honeycomb poles and he making his milli chips, and I I understood the concept, but then when he explained exactly how he did it and the amount of time it takes to make just one chip, you know, after after cutting it and polishing it and getting it prepped up and ready to be cleansed, it's it's no wonder he ha- has to, but also can sell them for a hundred and fifty, two hundred fifty, three hundred fifty dollars for a little small chip that's a pendant. You know, that back in the day we'd try to get maybe fifty bucks for it, maybe if we can get that. Yeah. You know, so the, yeah. uh, you know, it's neat to see that you know the knowledge is there, the appreciation is also there as a financial backing. You know, it's just oh yeah. yeah. I mean, shit. I've uh, I've done a lot of millies. I was doing basic pattern millies when I first started working. Like it was like I I I love them. And a few years ago, I started getting into like way more detailed millies, and then a handful of characters and got commissioned to do some stuff and. I, I really enjoy it. I took that uh, McClure fucking uh, McDaniels class, and that blew my mind what those guys were doing. And I've tried to do stringer stacks, like having taken classes from a couple of the best guys. I mean, Jerry Kelly came in and was a, a guest at the class. I mean, it was a room full of fucking big brains, you know? Yeah. And I've got a pretty damn good good concept on how millies are made and I made a bunch of them and I tried to do the simplest of stringer stats and got halfway through and bumped it and started over and got about a third of the way in and bumped it <laughs> oh, God. and I've never finished a stringer stat <laughs> Oh my god, dude! I understand that. It's I have some friends I was sharing some space with that recently. We were making them, and it's so much work. Holy shit! And I, I, you know. I spent a week. I spent a week in my spare time, like anytime I wasn't doing anything at the bench, pulling hair thin, absurdly like stringers. I would bitch at you for pulling if mm. you were working for me. Yeah, and sorting them and cutting them all to the right length, and. You know, I put a whole bunch of time into sorting that and then starting to stack it a couple times and, and just, you know, one little twitch of my hand ruining that whole day's stacking. Just like, oh, hell no. No way. I get mad props to the guys that can do it. I just, uh, I do not have that zen mindset. I can't, uh, can't slow myself down that much not the guy yeah i'm in the same boat dude otherwise i would have already tried it <laughs> you know <laughs> like i've you know i can make i can make millies and certain types like eyes and different things like i've actually wanted to make my logo as a millie just to just to go through the process you know but it's the same thing like you're saying it's, i've done you know. a really cool owl in the past nice. i did a uh an owl with uh really detailed eyeballs with stars in the pupils huh like reflecting in the pupils rad yeah that was a fun build 
Yeah, man. Speaking of that, I I still use your heart, Millie, your, your Illuminati heart ones that you I got from you a while back, and uh, awesome. I made, yeah, dude, I made a uh, tr- uh fucking what the hell's the thing called? It's a three headed dragon. I'm having a brain fart right now. A hydra, <laughs> and uh, I made his eyes with those Millies in it, and then I made a matching pendant with the same thing, and. I didn't tell the kid that I, they were in there and I was like, get your black light out and check this, this piece out. And I had like, they were, you know, they were hidden in the eyes cause you really couldn't see them with the light, regular light on. And he did, he was so blown away and happy about it. You know, just having these little happy hearts and this fierce looking crazy ass dragon, you know, and it's, it's those, yeah. you know, and it's those little details, bro. But you know, but on your end also your customer service is on point. Like I, I've got the Millie chip in and then you added like a little small honeycomb pendant in there, bro. That little pendant made my awesome. fucking, well, I'm, I'm glad you were happy. I, Man, I, I'll be the first one to honest or the first one to admit I suck at shipping and customer service. I'm admitting it publicly right now. <laughs> I'm I'm not prompt and speedy. I do my damnedest, but damn, I'm it it seems like every time I get one order, I get ten and then they all need to get shipped the same day and If you've ever spent any time with me, you'll notice that the more stressed out I get, the less the electronics around me work. Mm -hmm. Like, every time I I finally get, like, the laptop and the printer set up to print out shipping labels, the Wi-Fi will go down. (laughs) It's it's, uh, electronics fucking hate me. And it's... It's awful. Yeah, it's so funny. I, I'll, I'll, I'm the first one to admit it. Shipping is my uh, my weak my weak spot. It's my my enemy. Yeah, I think I most it. most of the guys I talk to and gals too, it's the same thing. You know, it's like I, like I preach all the time. If you've been doing this for like five years at least, it's time to get an assistant to help you ship your shit because it's like that one little extra thing you got to worry about. And it's such a simple thing to do. Like you're saying, man, you get a printer for like sixty bucks at fucking Walmart or Target, or whatever you got around your house, and it's Wi-Fi accessible. You can do all your stuff, weigh your shit out, yeah. all on the on the, all on the internet. You know, right in your house. My thing is, I'll have all that shit yeah. done, and then those fucking boxes will sit in my shop for two weeks, and they're ready to go. Yeah, I guess. Well, what the fuck fuck me up is I'll, I'll take thirteen packages to the post office, and one of them will fall behind the seat or something. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I I won't notice because. It'll be the one with Millie's in it, so it's a small envelope and it slides behind the seat. And then I clean in the car three days later, and it's like, oh fuck, what? Oh shit, this didn't ship. I'm a piece of shit, you know? Yeah. But ah oh, well. Yeah. I, I I do my damnedest to make up for it in other ways. Yeah, man. Yeah, I I, th- I do the same thing. But you know, like I'm tr- I'm trying to take a systematic approach at it, just with my schedule, like it is. Like I, I mean, I'm sure you're in the same way with having, you know, being busy, busy, busy. It's not a busy, bad thing. It's busy, like being productive. But uh, you know, mm-hmm. having my gig and the kids and blah, you know, all the shit I'm got going on. I've had to like systematically make it so like every Thursday is shipping. If you order on Friday, I'm sorry, but I can't ship until the following Thursday, unless it's an emergency or for like a gift. And I let them know it's like if this is a gift or something for somebody that you need to have like pronto. I need to know this now. So I can make arrangements to get this thing to you. Otherwise, it's not getting out till Thursday. And then sometimes that Thursday doesn't happen, and I got to wait till the following Thursday. But typically, Thursday has been like yeah, I my try day to, to ship. Do, uh, I try to do shipping on Mondays and Fridays to keep people happy, you know. And uh, but if if it's uh, if we've talked about specific, I, you know, something specific, I, I'll try to you know do what I can. But it it takes me the time of. Getting in the car, driving across town to the post office, waiting in line, putting the stuff in the post office, and you know, and people always say, "Oh, the postman can pick your stuff up," and it's like, but then I still have to wait out there with my shit and figure out when the postman's coming mm-hmm. and have all the postage printed up. And as I already said, man, every time I try to print postage, it's just a huge headache. So I don't even try to do it anymore. <laughs> right? Just yeah, it's like ah, I. I'm uh I I know my limitations and uh if uh when I, one of these days uh, when I'm set up somewhere and I'm a little bit more permanent I'll uh I'll try to hire an assistant to do shipping for me but uh who knows when that's going to happen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have to change your name or something too while you're at it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh yes. I, I'm uh I'm hoping to uh I'm hoping to settle down at some point, but uh 
I'm never going to not tour in the summertime. I mean, what the fuck, man? It's, there's too much fun to be had. There's shows all over the place. There's glass events all the time. And I love my glass family, and I, I really, really enjoy the road. Yeah. Like, uh, just seeing parts of America that I've never seen before, finding out the weird, uh, the weird things about your hometown. You know what I mean? Like, I never heard of a Wawa until recently, and apparently that's like some chain of stores somewhere. Yep, yep. You know, and uh-huh. you know, different different parts of the country. Just uh, there's there's all sorts of neat shit out there, and the the more you travel, and the more you learn, the easier it is to find common ground with everybody you meet. Yeah, I think uh, Mark Twain said uh, the biggest what what the hell did he say? Uh, the, the biggest enemy of bigotry is travel or something to that effect. I can't remember the exact words, but basically if you do enough travel and you can't fucking hate anybody. Yeah, it's true, man. <laughs> and you hear that too about like, you know, even international traveling, how really when you go to other countries that you have a certain perspective about, you know, thinking these people are freaking cavemen or whatever, and you get there and they're just like fucking we are. The same, same thing. They're just, exactly. you know, we're all the same. Same stress, same frustration, yeah. same bills, just a little bit different level. Depending on where you are. Exactly. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, man. So, what kind of torture are you running on nowadays? Um, I've been uh, I've been rocking a Delta Elite for years. I uh, not always the same one, but uh, it seems like every time I've uh, tried to go to a different torch, I've come back to the Delta. It's uh, I I fucking I love it. If you uh, if you run your pressures right and you know how to turn the knobs right, you can get a flame that'll mimic. Anything from the Phantom up, up through the Delta, people say, oh, too much flame, too much flame. I got to have a mirage for the controls. Turn the, turn the fucker down. Right. It doesn't have to be on full blast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, plus you're going to uh, conserve yeah, some got energy. A, got the Delta Elite as my main bitch, and then I've got a, a Gentech with a, a seven tip or a seven hole tip. Uh, I can't remember the manufacturers. I got it at got it uh, at one of the trade shows. I think I got it from Blast Shield. Okay. I might be wrong, and I don't want to you know, piss anybody off, but uh, I, I think it's a Blast Shield 7-hole. Okay. And then uh, I've got uh, Blast Shield Bunsen that I'm trying to make myself use more often. Yeah, I, I want to I get one of those, too. Have you found it beneficial when you are working with it? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. The hardest part is remembering to use it. And uh, being the lazy bastard that I am, I haven't uh, haven't plumbed it into a foot pedal yet. I've got all the shit. I just got to put it together. Yeah. Uh, as soon as I put it on a foot pedal, it'll be a lot easier to do it. Because right now I've got to flip a fucking lever and turn a dial, you know, turn t- open the open the valve up and then adjust it. And it's I I like microwaves. You know what I mean? I like shit to be right now. Yeah. So I got a foot pedal on my outer ring. So as soon as I as soon as I get it set up on a on a electric switch, it'll be uh be used a lot more often. Um, currently, I use the use the shit out of just uh my my beer belly. Uh, <laughs> I lean forward and smack the propane knob with my uh, with my gut, and it just uh, gives me a big fat fluffy flag. Nice. <laughs> I use that to Benson. <laughs> and I just. It's a, if, you, if, if you learn how to flex your abdomen just right, you can actually you can you can run the knobs with your stomach. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. It makes sense though. Absolutely. Even though I try to teach hey, proper yeah, body mechanics. I'm, yeah, but... I'm not. I'm not just talking shit. Watch my live cast. You'll see me adjust the torch with my stomach more than once. <laughs> Hell yeah, that's killer. Hey man, whatever it takes. You know, it's the the hands free approach, I guess. If yeah, anything. I mean, the, the foot pedal just turns it on and off. It doesn't turn it up and down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, and I've, I've actually worked on one of those foot pedals that has, like, the roller on there to adjust your flames and shit. And, man, I don't like it. It's just too crazy. It's too sensitive. Yeah, there's one that I've been trying to get my hands on from one of the locals here. A friend of mine said she'd trade it to me. It's one of the old uh, uh, Carlisle Machine Company uh, roller pedals. And I, I want it just... Because it's neat, I uh, 
I like the quick, uh, excuse me, got the hiccups. Sorry. Oh, you're I, good. I like the quick action of an electric solenoid. It's, it's right here, right now. Yeah, exactly. But the, uh, I think the, uh, the roller pedal, I'm not sure what I'll end up using it for. I might, you know, I might plumb my, uh, my Bunsen through that and just have it set up so I can just smack the propane, you know, with my foot, roll my foot up and turn the Bunsen up and down. Hmm. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Who knows? Hell yeah! So when you're traveling yourself, like, do you have a setup on your in your butt? Well, I guess I guess you, maybe you don't now because you got you're saying before we recorded that your bus is more or less new for you. But do you do you try to have like a setup in your in your traveling facility that you can work on the road with? Or oh, you I, mainly... um, I have um, a couple of different torch stands, okay. and I uh, I travel with uh, a propane can and an oxygen tank. So I've uh, I've got that. I've got two small kilns that always come with me, and this uh, oh holy crap! Sorry, a big ass uh, yellow jacket just buzzed my face. Oh nice. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I've got a this bus is big enough that I can actually put my uh, put my two hole furnace in the back underneath the bed and Rad. keep that with me on the road, so I can fit my whole shop in here. But it's uh, the clearance inside is only five eight, so I can't even stand all the way up inside this thing. Huh. But all, all my shit fits inside, and it's got enough power to move it all. So uh, I can roll the way wherever I'm going and set up and do demos. Um, future plans do include throwing a large awning on the side of this with uh, with side flaps, so I can just pull up and set up next to it and do demos. Yeah, yeah, smart. But yeah, it's uh, it's pretty. It's a pretty uh, sweet setup. But um, for for traveling, I've got like I said, I've got a couple of different stands. I've got one that's uh, my bare bones stand that I can just set my torch on if I'm somewhere that's kind of bench that's not a height that I that I like. And uh, I've got the blast shield that adjusts front to back and up and down. And then I've got a just a steel stand that. Is pretty straightforward at the post with a with a plate at the bottom, and then I've got a, a rollaway cart that is about six inches lower than my standard bench height, but I've got that adjustable blast shield deal, so it gives me a two and a half foot wide by eighteen inch deep work surface to have all my tools on with a nice drawer and a magnet rack to put my jacks and my shears on, and I can pretty much do anything off that roller. You know, I could, you know, turn the torch to the side and have no problem with clearance on anything. So, I mean, it's uh, pretty easy to get my whole kit mobile. Yeah, yeah, sounds like it. That's cool. Yeah, cause I think that, that would definitely yeah. be beneficial if you're going to be traveling a lot to be able to just keep things up and going. And, you know, unless, of course, you're going to a shop that's underpowered, per se, you know, that you can't plug everything into it. But I'm sure both you my, uh, both of my daily work kilns are... Uh, 15 amp 110 kilns by glass i have i had him build me two specific kilns for traveling one that's sweet short and wide and one that's a 10 by 10 cube with a guillotine door nice so i've got one that i can just run prep out of and it's big enough i can put like 16 handles across it but it's not really tall enough to actually do much finished work in unless i'm laying it down okay and then the other one has a chamber big enough to do just about any finished work in if I happen to be in a shop that doesn't have, you know, a kiln that I can get in, I can always rock those. Right, right. And small gasoline generator will run both those bitches at the same time. Nice. So, <laughs> you definitely get down. The foot pedal, I think it's 1.2 amps, so it doesn't pull shit. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, my, uh, my freaking speakers pull more than that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. That's too funny. Yep, yep. Hell yeah, Recently dude. Recently upgraded my travel kit with a, a new manifold block from uh, designed by Chris Kelsey, uh, Vertigo, uh, manufactured by Covington Machine. They, uh, he's got those really, really nice uh, manifold blocks he's putting out. I got one of those and filled almost all the holes with, uh, with Quick Connects. So... I can just plug that into whatever shop I'm in and then plug all my torches into it. And when I'm traveling, instead of having 
a huge octopus of hoses under the bench when I'm going. I can just unhook all my torches, and they've each got their own individual pelicans to go in. Nice. Mm -hmm. And my uh, my Delta and my Gentech go in one big pelican, and then the all the uh, all my hand torches and Bunsens and the rest of the hoses and as associated foot pedal plumbing and all that shit go into a, it's actually a, um, a rigid hard case uh, toolbox that clips into all my other toolboxes, but you know nice yeah. hard case that's got slots for everything. Badass. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's smart, man. So it's good to be organized yeah. like that instead of just throwing all your shit in a Tucker tote and trying to call it a day. You know, it doesn't work. Oh, man. It's, I can, uh, knowing where everything is in the toolboxes and knowing what toolboxes are, you know, everything's in makes it a whole lot easier to set up and tear down for demos. Yeah, exactly. And I, uh, I got, uh, what is it, a, a Pelican 1475. It's, uh, one of the large, uh, well, it's a, it's basically a, like the, Briefcase, you see fucking uh, handcuffed uh, the spy's wrist and all the tacky movies. Mm -hmm. Just like a large, uh, it's a, a laptop, a laptop pelican, and it's like 18 inches on the inside. So I could put even my biggest jacks in there, my biggest fucking ball grabbers, all that stuff, all my tools, all my graphite, all like everything fits in that motherfucker. And it's small enough that it can be my carry-on anywhere. And my uh, my Delta fits in the, um, the 1510, and that's carry-on. So if I got two pieces of carry-on, it's all of my tools and my torch, as long as TSA doesn't get freaked out on how pointy all the shit in my toolbox is. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. And if they get freaked out, it's a freaking Pelican. It's not gonna get, it's not gonna get trashed in the in the, you know, under the plane. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, man, I'm glad to bring it's that all up. Because letting all those, all those tools out of my sight scares the shit out of me oh, every time I've got to do it, though. Yeah, it's like letting your kid go run free for a little bit. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, it's shit, Don't even get me started, man. My my daughter just turned thir is turning 13 in, what, three days? Oh, uh, bro, mine's, mine's 17, graduating <laughs> high school this year. So, oh, I so understand. So terrifying, so terrifying. Yeah, it's crazy. Fortunately, she's staying local for school for a little bit, but then, uh, you know, she'll fly the nest and go do her thing. So, yeah. yeah, it's interesting stuff, for <laughs> sure. But I'm glad you're sharing all this about the traveling because I know a lot of folks out there like to travel and do their thing. So it's definitely something I wanted to cover. So definitely appreciate that. And with that being said, oh, man, yeah. I think it'd be a good time for us to take a break and uh, thank our sponsors. And then we'll come back and it'll be time for us right. to crash the kiln. Right on, right on. This segment of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Zen Dude Fitness. Lose 10 pounds this month by joining the Zen Dude Fitness 4-Week Jump Rope Fat Loss Challenge. Brandon and Dan will take you on a guided journey towards becoming the best you. Get fit, have fun, and find new ways to eat healthy while still enjoying the sweeter side of life. Just takes 20 to 30 minutes a day and no gym required. For more info and to sign up for the free four-week challenge, go to wiseguymedia.com forward slash zendudefitness. That's wiseguymedia.com forward slash zendudefitness. All right, we're back. So, uh, yeah, man, not to not to rush this out of here. I just think it's 6.30 here. I got to do, do din-din and stuff. Yeah, that was a crazy break. You should have seen it, man. All sorts of stuff happened in that uh, in that long commercial break we just took. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same here, man. Holy shit, I got a bunch of stuff made while I was at it too. So. <laughs> but uh, yeah, man. Oh, so, uh, so yeah, what was that? Where are we at? You said we're uh, in, in the lightning round. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, man, so the crash and the killing round consists of seven questions, and uh, we've changed up the last question here to make things a little more simplified. And uh, you can give me a 30 to 6 second answer on the questions, or we can expound upon them like they always do. And the first question I always <laughs> enjoy to ask is, if there is any living glass artist that you have not yet worked with, uh, who is it that you'd want to work with and why? Ooh, that is a really hard one, but I'm going to have to go with Paul Stankard. Um, we don't, uh, we don't use the same COE, but holy shit, he's, uh, 
he he blows my mind nonstop, and the guy's got so much fucking knowledge. Yeah. Every time I talk to him or read anything he's written, it gives me a lot to think about, and I always come away better for it. Yeah, I hear you. And I think it's fun with him too, man, because he loves to razz the pipe makers. You know, there's some cats mm -hmm. I've seen conversations go on, like, 30 40 comments if not more than that and everybody's just getting all pissed off and he's just sitting there laughing like i i didn't mean to get you all upset and heated i'm just trying to try to make a, a educational point or an educated point you know type of thing so i i don't know how it happened but i feel honored that the guy uh feels so open to talk uh yeah we we started talking in private message a while back and it's uh, it's not all the time or super frequently, but every once in a while I get a message and you know just question about something that's going on in the Boro scene or this or that or the other. And when he was writing his uh, the No Green Berries book, he sent me chapters of it every couple weeks to go over with him. Right. And who the fuck am I? You know what I mean? <laughs> Why would my opinion matter on any of that? That's but, too uh, cool. It, it, uh, it, it really, uh, I I want to spend some time with the guy in real life instead of just uh, just through clickety clack back and forth messages. I want to yeah. actually pick his brain. Yeah, man, he's a wealth of knowledge and a genius at what he does for sure. I completely agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hell yeah. Well, uh, number two question is, uh, what are your top five favorite colors in glass? Top five favorite colors. Um, gonna have to say. Uh, uh, clear old school Pyrex or <laughs> uh, Mystery Aventurine made before about 2012. <laughs> um, anything in the amber, purple, or Mai Tai family, any of the m massive amounts of uh, silver based striking purples, I love all of them. Uh, there's like three of them. Uh, yep. There's always a place for Elvis on my bench. And uh, shit, man. Cobalt. Gotta have cobalt. Hell yeah. What is your worst? But, I mean, oh, go on. Sorry. I mean, shit. That's, uh, that's just ones that I use all the fucking time. There's. With with the way the color companies are working these days and all of the new stuff that's coming out and the sharing of knowledge and the fact that I have my own furnaces and I can mix whatever the fuck I want, any day my favorite color might be something different. Yeah, man. Th and that being said, I think it's fantastic, you know, because I remember back when I was doing color and I was always told like, yeah, you can't mix color because it turns brown or gray. You know, it's like mixing a bunch of paint together, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, fast forward to like three years ago or two years ago, I took this class with Steve Sizelove and he's shown us how to mix down some some uh, yellow crayon with clear just to make it easier to use so it doesn't bubble on you. And it just opened up my mind to like, yeah, we could do anything with fucking color. And now I'm, I'm making my own colors that I need. You're doing a whole bunch of palettes. There's guys out there now that have all these little mom and pop spawned glass companies now that are, you know, making their own CFLs and their own UV glass. And, you know, they're fine tuning it and they're oh, giving man. us all a chance to R&D it and shit. It's amazing. I've got a treasure trove of recipes that I'm they're burning a goddamn hole in my pocket. I just, I gotta make this shit, but it's all stuff that right now I'm in a shared studio. Mm -hmm. And if I'm batching glass from raw chemicals, I'm exposing everyone to that atmosphere. Yeah. Whether or not our exhaust is amazing, which it is, that's they're not willingly exposing themselves to my work. They're sharing a space with me. We're all renters. I don't feel it'd be appropriate for me to do any batching in the situation where I'm at right now. I'm working on getting into a location where we have hoods for each specific furnace that are fume hoods that are always running. And everybody that's involved is there to batch glass. So, you know, then I'm going to, oh man, I, I, I can't really say anything about the cars I'm going to make because I don't want to let anything out of the bag, but God damn it, it's going to be <laughs> fucking hot. Yeah, I can't wait, man. Hope I get to test it. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, there's there's a, a couple of things I can say. If you paid attention to any of the colors I've been pulling, the phase shifter, I have figured out exactly how to refine that down and make it way less bubbly, nice clear that glows pink under LED UVs and bright blue under fluorescent LEDs. Neat. And I've managed to mix that with a number of other colors to get yeah, it, there's 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 some crazy shit coming. Hell yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. So, uh, what is your worst injury in the studio? Um, well, let me see. Worst injury in the studio. Well, um, I was working on an old National Eight M with the SM21 tip on it, which is about the equivalent to a, a Carlisle. It's a, it's a big, fat fucking ball of fire coming out of it. Yeah, like a 50 hole. the biggest tip you can put on one of those 8Ms. Yeah, it's like a 50 hole or and something like that. Yeah, yeah. And I was melting in an inside-out blank, and somebody walked into the shop and yelled at the top of their lungs. And I turned my head to the left and stuck my right hand right the fuck in front of the flame. <sighs> And it looked like somebody took a bite out of the meat behind my thumb, that that uh, big meaty pad where your thumb comes into your palm. Yeah. There was just a crescent missing, where it was just vaporized. Jesus. And yeah, I, I took the rest of the day off. <laughs> yeah, I would think so. <laughs> yeah, it was, oh, it was nasty. Yeah, dude. I've, I've, it was uh, yeah. it was such a a hot penetrating flame, and it. Like I stuck my hand right directly into it, so it was just like just burnt in the one spot. There wasn't a lot of radiant burn around it, mm-hmm. and it nuked a lot of the nerves. So I, I was able to put a silver beam the bandage on it and get back to work a couple of days later. Yeah, and then, but, then uh, yeah, my hand's still uh, God. <sighs> the there's still a weird pigmentation where the the dark skin on the top of my hand comes into the lighter skin in the palm of my hand. Mm-hmm. Where it just looks like somebody took a bite out of that on my right thumb, and it's a perfectly straight line on my left thumb. Jesus. Yeah, you it's know, no fun. But, uh, yeah. yeah, it's about the worst I've got it. I mean, I've, I've definitely cut myself and burnt myself, but uh, all my parts still work, and I got, I still got all my digits. Hell yeah! Well, actually, you know what? Nope. There was there was one worse than that that uh, when I was working in a home studio. I walked through the studio barefoot, and the tip of a chunk of 19 mil, like the end of a tube had been tapped on the floor, and just a crescent had snapped off of it. Oh. So it was like three quarters of the flame polished end, just like fucking real thin crescent moon with scalpels on either end. And I stepped onto that, and it followed that curve and buried itself into the heel of my foot, and I had to dig that out. And I couldn't walk right for about two and a half, three weeks because it the meat on the bottom of my foot was just shredded. Oh, man. That was that was awful. Fuck. Oh, I forgot about that one. Oh, that hurts thinking about it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Oh, man, but I like to ask it because, you know, we've all done some stupid shit, but sometimes it's not our fault, you know, like you're saying, some jackass walks into the studio and starts yelling, you know, like I know at home that when my kids would come out in the shop and they'd like immediately start talking to me, I'm like, okay, next time you come out here and you start talking to me like that, I'm going to scream at you and I love you, but just understand that you can cause me to hurt myself. So just stand there until I acknowledge your presence, you know. Man, fuck. Because I get it. Like, at, um, it's crazy. At the home studio in Michigan, we've got a, we've got a rule. There's a, there's a studio I share when I'm visiting my kids. My ex-wife's got a, got a shop out there. And if I'm working and she comes in or if she's working and I come in, you got to real quietly say, do 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 until they acknowledge it. You, know, like, you can't come in and be silent because then you're going to stir the shit out of me when you pop into my peripheral vision. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> Uh, we, we, we settled on a very subtle, nice, calm nose to announce presence. Yeah, that's too <laughs> funny. Hell yeah, yeah, dude. So, uh, do you have any uh, glass blowing theme tattoos? Um, let me see. Glass blowing theme tattoos. I've actually got a tattoo on my left forearm that I've had since before I was a glass blower. I got it when I turned 18. Um, it's Ganesh. 
but instead of uh, having like a peach in his hand, in one hand he's got a glass bong. In one hand he's got a straight razor. In one hand he's got a 40 of hat. <laughs> he's got a bunch of uh, degenerate items in his various hands. But I do have a glass bong on my arm that uh, predates my glass blowing. Fantastic. And um, I've got a tattoo started on my uh, on my abdomen that uh, is going to incorporate a set of jacks and a set of diamond shears. Got a big, like, two-and-a-half-inch wide pink and purple ribbon going across my stomach and doubling back down and going down to about the top of my belt line from the top of my ribs. They have uh, all my kids' names on the ribbon. And behind the ribbon, up my rib cage is going to be a set of jacks on the right. And up my rib cage on the left, he's going to put in a set of diamond shears. Just uh, just got to get up to Portland and get the tattoo finished. Yeah. Too cool. Yep. Hell yeah. So uh, when you're in the shop working, do you uh, prefer the radio, uh, watching TV, or both? All of the above. Um Depending on what time of day and what time of, what type of stuff I'm doing, I've got different media going. If I'm a, like a, I, I have never given up on production. I still do a lot of production designs, and it's stuff you'll probably not see on my Instagram or my Facebook. Just mm-hmm. lowering fucking shop photos. But if I'm if I'm banging out just photo photo photo, I I might have a TV show or a movie playing. Frequently, I'll put on, you know, comedies I've already seen or stand-up comedy or stuff like that when I'm uh, working and I've kind of got to pay attention, but I want something to distract me. Um, if I'm doing a uh, trap, like just pulling, uh, pulling stringers, I'll put on a movie that I want to want to pay attention to because I don't actually have to watch what I'm doing at all. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, in the morning, I tend to... Depending on how my day is going, I'll either listen to country or hip hop. And in the afternoons, I usually listen to listen to punk rock. It just uh, it's all all over the place. Lately, I've been listening to Wheeler Walker Jr. a lot. Every fucking time I put that guy on, he just cracks me up. Hell yeah! Uh, new new country. Uh, uh, if anybody's listening to this and they decide to lift the guy up and listen to him, I apologize in advance. He is as offensive as they come. He's going to say something that pisses you off, and that's why I like the guy. It's 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 uh, the best, best thing to come out of Nashville in 20 years. Nice. Hell but, yeah. uh, and I've been listening to a lot of uh, a lot of podcasts. In yeah. It's, uh, yeah, like I said, it's all over the place. Good, man. Yeah, it's important. Because I know myself, like, I got so burnt out on listening to the same fucking fish tape over and over again. <laughs> no matter what studio I was oh, in, I'm man. like, man, I'm so over this shit. I need something different. Back in the bad old days when all I was doing was production, and it was the same production over and over and over again, I had about, you know, I had a five CD changer. Mm-hmm. And I knew how many pipes I should have by what track I was on what album. Hell yeah. And that's fucking disgusting. Dude, I was the same way, though, dude. I totally understand that. And it's funny you say that, because I, I was actually, as I was going through that, the years of doing that, it made me want to do a series of work that was based on what it was I was listening to and just call that series, like, whatever the album name was, you know? And uh, But yeah, uh, I'm, I'm the somebody, same way. Uh, somebody posted on Facebook earlier today. Well, I saw it earlier today. I don't know where the fuck they posted it. But uh, I saw a uh, post on Facebook earlier today where someone, I don't know who the hell it was, said, I wonder if in the future scientists will be able to read a piece of glass and play back the sounds that were occurring as it was being formed. Hell yeah. Kind of like the the legend of the Lazarus dish. Right. Yeah, and, uh, that'd be fascinating. That would be, that would be interesting. There would be a whole lot of Rap and Rake Spoon Pipes that played Garage Days Revisited. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Hell yeah. I, I, man, that album wasn't even that good, but for getting work done, uh, Garage Days, then Modesky Martin and Wood Combustication, and then, oh, Jesus Christ, there was just five, oh, it was, uh, 
grabs the disc one of combustication, then uh, disc one of uh, full clip by Gangstar, then disc two of combustication, and then disc two of fucking Gangstar. And those five albums were, I, I'd say, eight months, all that I listened to in the glass shop. That's funny. And it's really only three albums. Some gangster shit there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, that's really awesome. Fun. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely some good tunes. If you if you haven't blown glass to combustication, you probably should. Yeah, I have to check that out. I never have. I'm, I'll have to give it a whirl. I'm I'm not huge into jam bands, but Modesty Martin and Wood has never done me wrong. Yeah, dude, I love those guys. Absolutely. Hell yeah, yeah. I saw them with Keller Williams a couple years ago, and it was like mind blown. Nice, mind nice. blown. I am still pissed off. That last week, Nashville Pussy played with Zeke 60 miles away from me, and I didn't know about the show until it was over. Oh, man, that sucks. Yeah. It, um, Nashville Pussy was one of the bands, uh, Nashville Pussy and Reverend Horton Heat. Anytime either one of those bands played within 100 miles of me, if my dad was in the same state, we went and saw them together. That was one of, the, one of those things like, we always saw the Reverend or Nashville when they came through. Hell yeah. And it bummed me out that they played that close and I didn't get to go fucking uh, put one in the air for the old man. Yeah, right. Huh. Uh, shit happens. Yeah, it sure does. <laughs> Too often than not, I guess. <laughs> mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, my last and final question, which has now been adjusted and changed for the times, is uh, what are your top five favorite tools? Top five favorite tools or top five tools that I couldn't work without. Yeah, uh, yeah, there you go. That's a good way to work. That might be a slightly different list. Yeah. Um, But um, are are we including torch? Because that's definitely one of them if we are. Yeah, I would. I would say with hand tools. Yeah, I'm gonna say hand tools because, like, for myself personally, like, I'm very simple. Like, I have a, a hand torch, my main torch, uh, a spoon, a knife, and gravity. Heck yeah. You know. So what do you got? Yeah, you don't need a whole lot more. No. But uh, let's see, top five. Um, the most frequently in my hands would be my big ass tweezers, my um, my small jacks. I don't know who made them. All I know is that the uh, the taper on the round blades is a one ten taper so if i use them to ream out a piece of tubing it makes a perfect fucking tapered joint nice size so like i use those jacks to open almost everything i ever open and i use those and the back strap to do fucking 90 percent of the shaping on my all my ground ground or well non-ground but yeah. hand formed one ten taper joints so uh yeah let's see tweezers my 110 jacks, um, my uh, Jim Moore check diamond shears, I use all the time just because they're the ones that are usually closest to my hand. I'm trying to get in the habit of using my uh, my Carl O'Donna diamond shears at the bench and keeping the Jim Moores for at the furnace and separating the two, mm-hmm. but uh, the Jim Moores just seem to always end up in my hand so so you got tweezers jacks and my shears and then i've got a large graphite rod that's uh tapered on one end and a bull push on the other and it's about 14 inches long and a little over an inch in diameter that i use for all sorts of shit and um my elm arbor hell yeah couldn't live without Oh, fuck. Hold on, hold on. Okay. Strike the graphite rod, blow hose. I, I won't work without my blow hose. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. My, my blow hose, even if I'm not using it, it's around my neck. Yeah. I, I don't work without that. And uh, shout out to Fire Kiss for making the best goddamn blow hose swivel I have ever found. Is it is it the double type that they like both ends swivel? Like, Are they both ends spin yep. on their own? Yeah, I got the 90 degree quarter inch, yeah. and and I'm not speaking lightly when I say it's the best one I've ever found because I have used antique Bethlehem 
like really nice scientific ones that sucked. I've used the cheap ass Indian ones from ABR and Glasscraft that suck. I've used Herbert Arnold fucking swivel, 90 degree swivel. And even though it was over built, over designed, and over engineered, you could take the fucker apart and clean it, had fucking sealed bearings and shit. It was too goddamn heavy. It mm. threw everything off balance. Interesting. The, the fire kit swivel above and beyond. It, it's the best motherfucker I've ever found. If it uh, if it starts binding up and acting weird on me, I throw it in a fucking uh, cup full of rubbing alcohol, shake it up real good, rinse it off with some hot water, and then blow a fucking compressed air through it and put it back to work. Nice. Never had an issue. Hell yeah. Good to know. I'll have to contact them to see about coming on the show and talking about their tools. Because part of this next season is I want to bring, yeah. bring some tool companies on and talk about their stuff. Yeah. I, uh, I used to, I used to make a lot more tools than I, than I do. And I, I started getting a little bit back into the tool making again. Um, I was recently talked into resurrecting my foot pedals. They're going to be, uh, they're going to be launching again real soon. Um, had, uh, one of the guys on Torch Talk, uh, started chatting me up and one of the other guys on Torch Talk decided, uh, if it had, uh, get me back into manufacturing foot pedals he'd just buy a dozen of them outright so he he bought a dozen so i'm i'm building them again nice so the the torch control box box by luke the drifter has been resurrected even though uh yeah they're <laughs> they take a lot of time to build and one of the reasons they quit making them is because of the guy i had hired to build them passed away hmm. but uh i'll uh I'll be building this first batch myself by hand and then uh, trying to find somebody else to step in and build them for me. But uh, they're, uh, they're all backed by a three-year uh, parts and labor guarantee. They're uh, the only only foot pedal I know of that will actually uh, stand behind their shit. Nice. Uh, the other ones might, but I've never heard of it. Well, yeah, dude. Once you get those things rolling, bro, we'll definitely promote those on the show. I'll definitely you know link that up on your show notes oh, yeah. and stuff and, and your webpage that we'll put together for you. It'll be killer. Heck yeah. Oh, and um, I got to give props to my buddy uh, Bob Harley Dog, their doghouse glass. He took my uh, V-necker design that I've been rocking for years and started producing them in steel with his initials blasted in them. So even though he, being the saint that he is, so much love for fucking Bob when he started making those, he told me about it and said, "Hey man, I'm going to give you fucking fifty cent or fifty percent of the profit off every single one of these I sell." Wow! And I said, "That's fucking awesome, Bob. Fuck you. You put that shit in the bank account for your son, and you tell him it's from his uncle Luke when he turns 18. <laughs> so that's uh, that's one of my tools out there. That every time you buy one of those DHG V neckers, not only are you helping Bob out, but you're helping." Uncle Luke give Bobby a present down the line. That's fucking awesome, dude. Tell ya. Yeah, man, he's a great I guy. I got my own kids to I got my own kids to take care of, but god damn it. I I got nothing but nothing but love for the doghouse family. They're yeah. they're some of the realest people out there. Yeah, I feel you, dude. When I had him on the show last year, it was like for one, his like you know, he came on and I was like, dude, your sound quality sounds better than my sound quality. You know the way he was coming across, it was so funny. But man, he just preached it, brother, and he just talked about his life and the way things got, went with him and the shit he's gone through. And I've I've gone back and listened to episodes several times just because of how inspiring he is, you know, and where he is now in his life and his yeah. losses and his wins. It's like, and he's still just out there educating and loving our industry. Fuck it, hey man, he's uh, he's one of the only guys out there that I will. Stop what I'm doing and fucking go cross country. If he says, "Hey, we need to fucking get some collabos made, man. Let's let's get to work." I'll stop what I'm doing and fucking be in his shop as soon as I can be there. He's one of the most inspiring guys to work with, and you know, there's a there's few people that have the work ethic that he's got and the drive that he's got. Yeah. I, yeah, he, he he pushes everybody around him to be better. Yeah, and That's I think for damn sure. Yeah, I completely agree, man. And I think with the whole Facebook Live and Instagram Living things, he's one of the cats that jumped on it real early. I mean, you know, he was doing the video stuff even with Torch Talk way beforehand. But you know, five a.m. man, sun's coming up. That fucker's out there in the shop, cranking up the kiln and getting busy. He's like, rise and grind, bitches. What are you doing? You know. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, shit. I I, I stood out there for uh, two weeks before Vegas, and every day I. I'd try to wake up before him. Ain't no fucking way to do it. I don't think he sleeps. Yeah, I wonder. He's something. 
<laughs> yeah, he's like the guys like the, I, I, the Tom think, Brady's that you know they're the, the first person to get there and the last person to leave. I I, I seriously think uh, I think when he goes into the house, he fucking uh, pulls up his shirt and his old lady changes the battery and he just goes back to it. <laughs> Oh, uh, he's got some kind of hyperbaric chamber or something he sleeps in for like an hour. Something. Uh, yeah, man, he's a, he's definitely definitely an inspiration. Hell yeah. Awesome stuff, brother. Well, it was fun chatting, man. Uh, definitely appreciate you coming on, and I'm glad we finally hooked this up. And look forward to the day we get to melt some glass together. One of these one of these here coming to soon days, man. Hell yeah. Trip to Tour 17 is going to be hitting as many states as I can. Beautiful. Well, I'm about six blocks from the Gulf, and down here in Florida, man, we got a beautiful, beautiful spot, so we can make it happen. Heck yeah, heck yeah. Um, I've I've got a handful of inv- invites from Florida, and I've uh, I've only been there one time, and I gotta say, it was beautiful. Yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah, man, we can make a two day trip out of it. Do some glass one day. We can go hit Disney and go f- be little kids in the park and stuff. I can give you like the VIP tour and shit, and you know, have a lot of fun, man. We didn't even really touch on it, but uh, when I was four years old, I got I got to do a little detour here. Me and my family went down to Disneyland uh, and Knott's Berry Farm, and I I was four. I don't remember if it was Disneyland or Knott's Berry Farm. My mom said it was fucking Knott's Berry Farm. My dad said it was Disneyland when I got separated from them for a good solid two or three hours. Mm. And... I watched that son of a bitch sit there and make little angels for a little while, and then he started making uh, making pirate ships out of fucking lace work. Yeah. And I just sat there staring at him. I didn't know I was lost. I didn't know my family kept walking. I saw that going and just stopped <laughs> and kept watching until they came back. And that that was when the hook got set right yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, man, it's amazing. That's one of my my favorite things about the the having the position I have is to just inspire these new generations. And I mean, much less showcase the 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 art and the craft of it, but really like, there's so many people that in, that are in our industry that have been inspired just from going and seeing a glass blower do something live when they were a kid. They maybe not thought they'd do it ever, but they saw that as a kid, and then one day they see the torch and the ability to do it, and like, fuck, I'm gonna do this. So it's it's pretty cool. Heck yeah, it's pretty cool stuff, man. Well, before we let you go, brother, if you want to tell us where we can find you out there in the world of cyberspace. And then, uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, the easiest way to find me would probably be uh, my Instagram, which isn't the easiest name to remember. It's underscore Luke underscore the underscore drifter. That's uh, that's me on Instagram. On Facebook, I'm Luke Bailey, spelled all strange B A Y L I E. And uh, if you can't find me on Instagram, just look for the hashtag Drifter Tour. Hashtag Drifter Tour 17 or Luke the Drifter, and you'll either uh, either find me or some guys building Harleys. Hell yeah. Apparently, there's four or five guys on Instagram named Luke the Drifter that build really nice bikes. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking funny. I'll have your uh, I'll have it all yep. in the show notes for everybody to check out for sure. So it won't be it won't be a problem there. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, man. So hang on real quick after the show, we'll say goodbyes, but uh. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode with Luke the Drifter, Luke Bailey here, having a lot of fun talking glass and shopping and traveling and being a nomad. And as you can see, it's, if you got the drive and the inspiration to want to travel the country or the world, it is at your fingertips. If you just get a little bit of knowledge in your belt and it's a good foundation in glass, you can travel around and meet artists and com- collab. And man, the sky's the limit. So hope you enjoyed. And we will see you next time on the Wise Guy Radio Show. Y'all take it easy. Peace. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Glassroots Art Show. Now entering its ninth year, Glassroots is designed for artists and distributors who wish to do wholesale business with shops and galleries. Located at the Monona Terrace Convention Center on beautiful Lake Monona in downtown Madison, Wisconsin, the art show features at least 25 glass workers demonstrating and creating pieces for public viewing, live and silent auctions, raffles, and approximately 40 booths consisting of raw material supplies, functional and non-functional art, and glass charitable organizations. This year, in 2017, Glass Roots will be held October 9th through the 11th. And for any more information, just go to glassrootsartshow.com. That's glassrootsartshow.com. This episode is also brought to you by The Flow Magazine. Since its inception, 
The focus of the flow has been to provide a bond among members of the lampworking community. This has been accomplished by developing relationships with the finest artists and sharing their techniques with you through in-depth, step-by-step tutorials. In every issue, you can enjoy great content with the hottest artists and cutting-edge techniques using the latest industry products. These features, along with the continuation of our Women in Glass edition, Glasscraft Emergent Artist Awards, inspiring gallery showcases, dynamic general interest articles, as well as health and safety information, make The Flow the leading international lampworking journal. For more information or to subscribe to The Flow, go to theflowmagazine.com. That's theflowmagazine.com.